Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. Uh, we're pleased once again to bring you a message from the Rapid City Seventh Day Adventist Church. And this is primarily for our folks in the Rapid City and Hermosa area. But uh, if you're joining us online, we're happy to have you with us. We're going to sing a little song that you probably know, and then we're going to open up with prayer and then a message that God has put on my heart. Hopefully you know this song. It's called Whisper a Prayer. And so feel free to sing along. Whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. God answers prayer in the morning. God answers prayer at noon. God answers prayer in the evening to keep your heart in pray. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another Sabbath day. We thank you for answering our prayers. We thank you for all the things that you are to us. And Lord, as we contemplate how you answer prayer, we just pray that you draw near us today. Send us your Holy Spirit. May we learn something about you that we can praise you for. Lord, keep us safe in our time apart. And we pray that we, we will be back together again soon. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning once again and happy Sabbath to you. I have a, a message that I want to share with you. As I said, the Lord has put on my heart. This last week there was a little pastor's round table that we did and it was a good God and bad world. And so some of the things that are going to be presented here uh, will dovetail in with uh, a lot of the thoughts that were shared on that. and. Uh, um, you'll find that on our YouTube page or our websites, our Facebook pages. Uh, if you'd like to do that, we do that every other week. But the message today is entitled, If God is so good, why so much suffering and pain? C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, 
had this to say, If God were good, He would make His creatures perfectly happy. And if He were almighty, He would be able to do what He wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. And you see, C.S. Lewis did not buy into that mindset. But that's what people try to say. If God were good, then He'd make me happy. Why am I not happy? And we don't have to look very far in our world or, or turn on the news for very long and we, we see all sorts of things happening and we see definitely the problem of pain. But it doesn't answer the question, why? I think back a couple of years, there was a gunman, Stephen Paddock. He opened fire on a crowd that was attending the Route 91 Harvest Festival from his 32nd floor room uh, at the Mandalay Bay Resort and in, in, in Casino um, there in Las Vegas. The rampage lasted for more than 15 minutes as panicked concert goers tried to take cover, unaware of where the fire was coming from. And by the end of it, 58 people were killed and more than 850 were injured. By the time a police SWAT unit broke into Paddock's room, they found the gunman dead by suicide. Why? You know, there's no words to describe the anguish being felt by those who suffer in the midst of such tragedies. And these tragedies are becoming all too common. Our heart and our prayers have and will go out to those who have suffered under such circumstances. There are so many tragic stories that we could share, so much pain, there would not be enough time to tell it all. And many people are asking the question, why? Why did God allow this? I think of a couple of years ago, and it's been going through this year even, uh, California wildfires, but a couple of years ago, uh, or a year or so ago, um, the campfire in uh, California. Uh, and, and these fires seem to be getting more frequent and more intense and, and more devastating. And dozens and dozens of people lose their lives and, and the untold damage to property. I think of the wildfires in Australia that took up so much of the news for so long before the latest tragedy that's hit the world. In the United States alone, the coronavirus cases were, are approaching one million and uh, we're on the cusp of 50,000 deaths. And that's just since the first part of the year and, and really since the end of February in this country. And so we ask, why? Why so much pain? Why so much suffering? Why so much sorrow? All these tragic events are on top of the everyday pain and suffering that we experience in our individual lives. Maybe you're having pain in your life. Maybe you are suffering with something today. There's illness, abuse, broken relationships, betrayal, sorrow, injuries, disappointment, heartache, crime, and death. And perhaps you've been asking the same question that the world asks. Why, Lord? Why me? And why now? That why question goes back thousands of years. And it was asked in the Old Testament by Job and the writers of Psalms and and it was especially relevant during the 20th century. We witnessed two world wars, a Holocaust, genocides in the Soviet Union and China, and in the killing fields of Cambodia, the emergence of AIDS and, and the genocide in Rwanda and the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo and, 
and 9-11 and the, and the war on terror. And we ask, why all of this, if there's a loving and powerful God, why do bad things happen to good people? And so we see all these things and we ask the question, why? Several years ago, a national survey was asked of people and they, the question they'd ask is if they could only ask God one question. If they could ask Him only one thing, the number one response was why so much suffering in the world. If you've never asked why our world is so infected with the pain and suffering, then you will when, they, when that pain and that suffering strikes you full force. Or maybe a loved one in your life and it becomes an actuality and it becomes real. Jesus said they are coming. That's what he said. He said pain, sorrow, suffering is coming. coming. Unlike some of the other religious leaders in the world who wrote off pain and suffering as, as being just illusions. It's not really happening. You're not feeling it. If you just get in the right mental state, you wouldn't suffer so much. But Jesus was honest. He told us the truth. And in John 16, 33, he said, you will have suffering in this world. He didn't say you might. He said it's going to happen. But why? If you ask me point blank, why did God allow the gunman in Las Vegas to do what he did? Why did he allow the fires that ravaged Australia and, and so much of the West, Southwest? Why do so many innocent people have to suffer for no apparent reason? And the only honest answer that I can give you this morning is I don't know. I can't stand in the shoes of God and, and give a complete answer to that question. I don't have God's mind. I don't see with God's eyes. But we get a hint, a clue in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. There in verse 12, it says this. For now we see in a mirror dimly. And if you've ever taken a shower and, and let the steam build up in the bathroom and you step out of the shower and you look into the mirror, you know there's an image there, but you can't quite make it out. And so we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also, also am known. You see, so there's a partiality to, to the, the reason and rationale, and we, we think we know it, but we don't know it completely. It's like looking in a fogged up mirror. As a child, I can remember making handprints on the, uh, on the bus and you would blow on the window and it would fog up and then you could write things on the bus. And, but when you fogged up the window, you couldn't see out. And so you had to clean it off so you could see out. And so we can, we can understand that. You know, when we think of the individual events and we want to know why this particular thing happened, we won't get the full answer on this side of eternity. Someday we will see with absolute clarity, but for now, things are foggy. We can't understand everything from our finite perspective. And frankly, the people suffering from tragedy don't need a big theolo theological treatise, some dissertation on suffering any intellectual response that, that they are given is going to seem very inadequate and small. 
What they desperately need now is the very real and very comforting presence of Jesus Christ. They desperately need Him in their lives so that they have something that they can cling to that won't fail. And I'm so grateful that there's so many in our midst and there's so many across the world in different churches and ministries that are helping people who have suffered loss and pain. They are helping them experience just that, Jesus Christ. So for us, let's focus on the big overarching issue of why, why God generally allows suffering in our lives, your life, my life, our friends' lives. And this is important. Even though we can't understand everything about it, we can understand some things. So I would like to share an analogy. I can remember traveling home uh, from an evening out with my family, and it had been raining earlier that day, and and uh, the weather was kind of changing, and, and, and the weather just kind of rolled in, but as the night fell, it got foggier and foggier, and, and it was only eight miles to our home. And as we were traveling, we noticed that the fog was getting thicker and thicker. And even though I knew the way home, I couldn't see my way home. Well, we had an old car, and and the headlights weren't the best, and, and it wasn't equipped with fog lights, and I thought, well, if I could just see the lines on the side of the road, I'll be fine. And they were difficult to see. Well, lo and behold, a semi pulled around me because I was going so slowly. And, and as he passed me, I wondered, well, how is he seeing something I'm not? But of course, he had big lights, and he had all sorts of... Of, of, of equipment to light the road in front of him. And, and as he passed me, he was going at a pretty good clip. I knew the direction he was heading. I knew where I needed to go. I just couldn't see how to get there. And at the same time, as he passed me, I noticed some taillights. Little points of light in front of me I could see. I couldn't see the road. I couldn't see off the side of the road. I couldn't see very far, but the person in front of me could see far enough. He could see the lines, I'm sure. And whether it was good judgment or bad judgment, I followed those taillights all the way home. And so we can identify with this clarity problem that we have currently. Well, I want to share with you as briefly as I can five different points of light that we can follow. And so if we have tragedy in our life and suffering in our lives, and, and we know there's certainly tragedy and suffering in the world, we might not be able to make out all the details of why, and they may, may be obscured from our view, but there are some key biblical truths that are like points of light that we can see to help us through. And if we follow those lights, they will lead us in the right direction towards some conclusions that I believe can help us satisfy our hearts and souls in this question, why? What are those points of lights? Well, I found them to be helpful in my life in keeping me on track and helping me understand that I won't know the why here, but if I just follow those points of light, I will get home. Well, the first point of light that I want to share with you um, of these five points of light is that God is not the creator of evil and suffering. The answer, this answers the question you hear, why didn't God just create a world where tragedy and suffering didn't exist? 
Well, God is not the creator of evil and suffering, and in fact, He did create that world. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that first part of the verse says that God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. God did not create a world of suffering and pain and tragedy and heartache and loss. What He created was very good. Well, we don't have to get too much farther past Genesis chapter 1 or 2. And then we find in the third chapter, we know the story. It was the fall of mankind. He made a perfect world where there, everything that he made was, was good, but there was a freedom of choice. And our earthly parents chose to disobey. They chose to let sin come in. They chose to let death in the door. And tragedy struck. You know, God gave us free will. He didn't just make us robots. Um, my daughter, as she was growing up, if you can remember back this far, some of you, uh, she had a little Teddy Ruxpin. And it was a, a cassette that you'd put in a teddy bear and the bear would talk to you. And it had different things, that, different stories it would tell you. But it would only tell you the story that you programmed it to tell. For a little child, she, she was filled with wonder. But after a while, that kind of wore off. And then it just became a regular teddy bear because she said, I already know what it's going to say. God did not program us like a Teddy Ruxpin to say, I love you, and to, to interact with him. He programmed us with free will to love us. And so we know the story. Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we, we see the results of sinful action in our lives. You know, God made our hands. And for 99.9% .9 of the population, we have regular hands that do regular hand things. But God made your hand, but He didn't make your hand like the, the shooter in Las Vegas. He didn't make your hand to shoot. The same hand that has the opportunity to shoot has the same opportunity to feed a hungry person to comfort a, a, a struggling soul. And so we have that. We can choose to use our hands in one way or the other, for good or for bad, and that's where the pain and the suffering comes in. It's because it's our choice. It's unfair to shoot someone and then blame God for the existence of evil and suffering. Well, there's another kind of evil that exists. Uh, it's called a natural evil. Uh, these things are like wildfires and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, and they cause suffering for people. We've seen that just recently in the news down in Texas and Oklahoma and through there. There's devastation once again with tornadoes, and earlier this spring and, and probably all summer, it never ends, it seems. But these two are an indirect result of sin as being allowed into the world you know, one philosopher and author explained when humans told God to shove off God, he partially honored our request. And nature began to revolt. And the earth was cursed. Genetic breakdown, disease began, and pain and death became part of the human experience. The Bible says that it's because of sin that, that nature was corrupted and thorns and thistles entered into the world. Romans 8.22 says, uh, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In other words, nature longs for redemption to come and for things to be set right. 
Let's make this crystal clear once more. God did not create evil and suffering. He left the potential there because of choice. Some people ask, couldn't God have foreseen all this? And no doubt he did. But look at it this way. Many of, many of you are parents. Did you know ahead of time that your kids might disobey? And yet you had them anyway? And for the vast majority of us, we love them anyway. Didn't you foresee that your child might suffer in this world and yet you had them anyway? Because you also knew there was a potential for tremendous joy and a deep love and great meaning to life. That's not a perfect analogy, but think about God. He undoubtedly knew that we would rebel against him. But he also knew that many people would choose to follow him and have a relationship with him. And spend eternity in heaven with him. That's what we're looking forward to. He thought about it and it was worth it all to him, even though it would cost him his own son. His own son that would suffer greatly and feel pain. So it helps me to remember as I ponder the mystery of pain and evil that God did not create either one. The second point is though suffering isn't good, God can use it to accomplish good. He does this by fulfilling his promises in, in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, the picture there on the screen is of some Christian martyrs. I wonder if that verse was going through their heads at that time. How can this work together for good? But people saw the commitment of these Christians and, and they wondered what kind of God is this they serve that they are willing to give up their lives and to suffer. You know, the Old Testament gives us a great example in the story of Joseph who went through terrible suffering and being sold into slavery and being accused of a crime and falsely imprisoned. And finally, after uh, uh, several years, he was put in a role of great authority where he could save lives, not only of his family, but of many, many others. He told his brothers, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. So God sees further down the road than Joseph. He sees farther down the road than Daniel in a lion's den. He sees farther down the road than you and me in our, our current suffering. You know, he promises that he can and will take whatever pain you're experiencing and he will draw something good from it. Well, you say, my circumstances are different. Mine are harder. Mine are much more difficult. The damage is too extreme. In the depths of my suffering, it has been too much. In my, in my case, there is no way that God can cause any good to emerge. But if you doubt God's promise, listen to what a wise man said once in the book, That Case for Faith. It said, God took the very worst thing that has ever happened in the history of the universe. Decide or the death of God on the cross. And it turned it into the very best thing that has happened in the history of the universe. When Jesus gave his life, he took the worst thing and turned it into the best thing that's happened for you and me. God can make something good out of the evil that happens in our life. He, he does this by fulfilling that promise, for sure. 
The third point I'd like to make is the day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. You know, um, there's a lot of times you'll hear people say, if God has the power to eradicate evil and suffering, then why doesn't he just do it? Uh, and the answer is because he hasn't, just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean he's not going to. The Bible tells us in that point of light as we're trying to, to follow those, those, those points of light through the fog of today, he says the day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. You know, it's like an unfinished puzzle or an unfinished book. Have you ever been reading a book and you only got partway through it and you set it down and you say, well, nothing was resolved and, and, and nobody, uh, nobody won and, and, and it was just left in a bad place. And they say, well, how far along are you? Oh, only halfway. It's kind of like that. It's like the, the whole book hasn't been read yet. It hasn't been presented. The whole puzzle hasn't been put together yet. It doesn't mean it's not a, a good picture. It's just that I don't have the complete picture yet. God will use, He can and will use, our suffering to draw us to Himself, to mold and sharpen our character, to influence others for Him. He can draw something good from our pain so we know that. He will judge evil. Justice will be served in a perfect way. There will be an end to sickness and suffering. So what's holding him up? A little bit of a clue, a little, a little point of light in the fog. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us. God suffers. He's patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us to come to Him. And so part of the, of the waiting is that He's waiting on us. I think of some of these other things that are happening in our world. Point number four says that this point of light is our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for those who follow Him. Paul put it this way, you know, and I don't want to minimize our, our pain, I don't want to minimize our suffering that we're going through, but it helps if we take a long-term perspective. Look at this verse that's coming up and remember they were written by the Apostle Paul who suffered through beatings and, and stonings and shipwrecks and imprisonments and rejection and hunger and thirst and homelessness and far more pain than most of us will ever have to endure. These are his words there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, For our light affliction. What do you... What do you think about that? Our light affliction. He says it's just for a moment. And I, I, and I look at those words and I say, Paul, it seems like it lasts forever. And it's not that light of an affliction. But in perspective of what's coming, this holds no comparison this light of affliction that's just for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He was flogged 39 lashes with a whip. Three times he was beaten to a bloody pulp by rods. But he says, for our light and momentary affliction... Paul also wrote in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. He says it's not even worth comparing. There's a story told of a 
British church leader about meeting a young man who had fallen down a flight of stairs as a baby and it shattered his back. And he had been in and out of hospitals his whole life. And yet he made the, the astounding comment that he thinks God is fair. Galvin Reed, this church leader, asked him, he says, how old are you? And the boy said, 17. And Reed asked, well, how many years have you spent in the hospitals? And the boy said, 13 years. And the pastor said with astonishment, and you think that that's fair? And the boy replied, well, God has all eternity to make it up to me. In 13 years, compared to eternity, there is no comparison. Amen? God will make it up. To this young man. God will make it up to you and me. He promises a time when there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, and we will be reunited with God in perfect harmony forever. Let the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 soak into your soul. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. We have no clue. This suffering shouldn't even be on our radar when we compare it with what God has in store for us. The fifth point of light that uh, we want to talk about this morning as we draw to a close, we decide whether to turn bitter or turn to God for that peace and courage to go through the suffering. It's a simple choice. Be bitter about it or turn to God for comfort. We've all seen examples of how the suffering that causes one person to turn bitter and to reject God and become hardened and angry and sullen can, can cause another person to turn to God and become more gentle and more loving and more tender, willing to reach out compassionately because they say, I can sympathize with you. I've been through it. Some people have different reactions to suffering. Some, somebody might have lost a child to a drunk driver. They turn inward and there's chronic rage and, and there's never-ending despair and they can't get over it. Another one turns outward and helps others by founding an organization like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. One philosopher stated it this way, I believe all suffering is at least a potential good. It's an opportunity for good. It's up to our free choice to actualize that potential. Not all of us benefit from suffering and learn from it because that's not up to us. It's up to our free will. What do I do with my suffering? Do I turn bitter or do I turn to God? We either make a choice to run away from God or to run to Him. But what happens if we run to Him? God doesn't want you wondering. He doesn't want you being overly anxious of whether or not you're headed to heaven. His, His infallible, inerrant Word tells us that you can know for sure. Don't rely on the fact that you come to church or, or you've gone through some kind of a study or, or maybe a religious lit, rit, ritual that you've been baptized or, or you take communion. It's not your religious activities or your affiliations. Those have never saved anybody. It's been Jesus Christ. A personal knowledge of Him that brings you salvation. It comes from knowing Him and receiving His provision for your sin. And that He can give you your future. It comes from making Him your Savior. By asking Him to forgive your every sin and by asking Him to lead in your life. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen by attending church, which we're unfortunately not able to do right now. 
That's not how it happens. It doesn't happen by hanging out with a bunch of Christians. It comes from deciding in your heart, making that conscious decision that you want to turn from your sin to repent. And even that is a gift, according to Scripture. And to surrender, to whisper a prayer. God, help me. And it's his forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased on the cross for you and me that he offers so freely. That is how you gain God's peace and confidence. You know, I started this message today in John 16, verse 33. Now let me give you the whole verse, the entire verse. These things I have spoken to you that you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When we're hurting, He gives us peace to deal with our present and courage to deal with our future. Jesus has conquered the world. Through his own suffering and death, he has deprived this world of its ultimate power over you and over me. Suffering doesn't have to be the last word anymore. Death does not have to be the last word anymore. God has the last word. So settle it now. Resolve it today. Right now, at this moment, in your homes, on your knees, so that if real tragedy were to strike, that your eternity with God would be secure. You know, I don't know the ways that God is going to use to draw some good from this situation that we're in right now and all the tragedy and the suffering that's going on. But wouldn't it be something if he were, if he were starting right now with me personally, with you personally, using this message to bring you into his kingdom right now. Let the pain of, of tragedy open your heart to Christ. Let's take what was intended for evil and watch God start creating something good from it. So I want to pray with you right now. Let's bow our heads. Loving Christ, we believe that you are the unique Son of God. And we acknowledge the fact that we have all fallen short of your glory. We've all sinned. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that introduced sin. We have voluntarily come along. We are all sinners indeed in need of a Savior. So right now, we just ask for that gift of repentance, that gift of faith. And we're reaching out to you just now, and we ask to receive that free gift of forgiveness that you offer, the eternal life that you died for and purchased on the cross, and that you suffered and felt pain for each and every one of us. Please, Jesus, lead in our lives. From this moment on, we are yours, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Prison walls.
walls I've built I cannot climb They're closing in on me Captive of my own troubled mind Lord, come rescue me Rescue me from the man that I am Free me to be Servant of the sin that I crave Hostage of the enemy So far from home I feel just like a slave Lord, come set me free Free from the man that I am Free me to be Didn't come to give us what we want But give us what we need To break the chains of sin and circumstances Bondage set us free Free from the man that I live Free me to be Just free.